Jared Miracle is the author of a really interesting book called Now with Kung Fu Grip, How Bodybuilders, Soldiers and a Hairdresser Reinvented Martial Arts for America. Jared, how are you doing? <laughs> we live in interesting times as the uh, as the old Chinese curse goes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. May <laughs> how, we live through been? interesting times. Yeah, may we get out of interesting <laughs> times. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so the the book, the book title, the book right. title. I mean, let, let's talk about that. What what's the reference? What what do you have to know to to understand what it's what it's saying to us? Um. Well, uh, part number one was try to grab people's attention because academic books tend to have rather boring titles. Uh, and I think it's a, I think it's a generally exciting story that I would like people outside of academia to have actually, you know, to have some, some sense of what happened. Uh, because it's very bizarre when you begin to drill down into the present state of things. I always point out to people, every small town in North America has some kind of a, a Chinese restaurant or Chinese themed um, and they all have a Taekwondo school but there's no fencing club there's no boxing club and that that's that's rather an odd state of things I think hmm. uh, so the title anyway is uh, soldiers went to Japan and and brought back Japanese martial arts which is why they were so endemic in the U.S. for a very long time uh, until the great Korean advertising machine took over hmm. brilliant <laughs> um, let's see bodybuilders uh there is a heavy element of of body uh body image issue that comes up in the in the course of things um we, we can talk about that with our mutual love of, of violent action films <laughs> uh, and the hairdresser is one of my favorite historical characters of all time count juan rafael dante the deadliest man alive Yes, uh, yeah, you've 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 written about him um, elsewhere as well, and he is a really interesting character. So I'm just going to look at the table of contents again here. I've whizzed across. So we 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 start right back with the with the YMCA. I mean, so 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 you frame this in it's quite a long history. You connect it to muscular Christianity movements in kind of. 19th and 20th century American ideology. I mean, why, why go that far back? Why do you need to, to set that kind of a context before you start to talk about martial arts in the US? It's, that's a very good point that it was, uh, the project was very ambitious and perhaps the product was, did, did not live up to my ambitious expectations. Largely that was a matter of time crunch. The book honestly just needs to be rewritten at this point. Um, I'd like to go back and and basically double it. Uh, why why we have to go back to the YMCA is that it sets the entire stage for historically the the U.S. is essentially the child of of England, right? Like we have lots of cultural influences. People here like to talk about it being a a multicultural society, but the fact of the matter is that the mainstream general culture, especially at the at the turn of the last century, was almost I would say 80 to 90% is, is derived in some manner from, from uh, English culture. And so naturally boxing and, and fencing to some extent and, and wrestling are the, are the martial pursuits that people go into uh, recreationally, which did not historically match up very well with the, uh, with the Christian paradigm of the time, the, the nonviolence and peace and love and that sort of thing. But then along comes this muscular Christianity that sort of militarizes uh, this entire religious spiritual movement and, and somehow finds a way through the, through the auspices of the YMCA of all things to meld the two together so that now it's the Christian thing to do to punch your neighbor. So, so, the, the, so muscular Christianity emerges at a certain point of, of kind of nation building when, when um, the people who are managing and, and, and administrating kind of culture are concerned about the production of young men and what kind of young men. And, and so we have the YMCA in the West and there's the scouting movement and there's the Jingwu um, Association in Shanghai. And these are all kind of happening at the same sort of time. Um, right. 
and and don't forget that in Japan at, at about the same time we have uh, we have this interesting movement to nationalize combat sport and use it as an inculcation mechanism for young people. And I, I find the story of karate particularly interesting because it's not natively Japanese, but it becomes Japanized over time. Hmm. Um, but all of these are are essentially addressing the same issue of. Uh, what in what in most of the English speaking world was referred to at the time as neurasthenia, uh, this concept that if if men who once would have been in manual occupations move to urban centers and they're only doing what was referred to as brain work uh, in these white collar type positions, they will they will sort of become frail and weak and this will affect their minds. And that's where Theodore Roosevelt steps into the picture. Mm hmm. And, uh, and argues for the virtues of wrestling and and jujitsu, and I mean, is is he a huge a huge influence on the uptake of of jujitsu as maybe the first Asian martial art that that is mainstreamed in the U.S. Absolutely. Prior to the president of the United States being depicted in uh, in editorial comics as tying his his political opponents into pretzels the only major exposure outside of of uh, asian immigrant communities to any type of east asian martial art are these occasional newspaper clippings you'll see of a of a kung fu exhibition um or occasionally there will be a, a a sort of a kendo slash judo pro wrestling style expo but nothing where they're trying to to draw in mass crowds hmm. when roosevelt starts doing this activity uh by golly, it is now the thing to do. Hmm. Um, and then we can we can also take a sideline there and talk about how the rhetoric surrounding jujitsu in particular um, ends up being empowering to to smaller people. Even though if you've if you've ever played judo, you're you're well aware that it's a it's a large man's game. Uh, <laughs> in fact, in Japanese, they sometimes have a joke where they will transpose the character for ju meaning soft or pliable with ju meaning heavy. Okay. Uh, but but anyway, so it, it's taken up by the suffragettes, right? In the in the movement for uh, for women's suffrage, and so now it's it's truly are adopting it, and men are adopting it, and uh, it becomes. Well, and people forget that Roosevelt's judo teacher was not originally invited to the U.S. to train Roosevelt. He was invited to train the frail child of a wealthy man who had heard that jujitsu could could uh, build up his son. And so, yeah, absolutely. And, and Roosevelt takes on this rhetoric he eventually refers to as the strenuous life, uh, which goes even beyond just boxing and jujitsu. And he's he, he becomes a rancher and he... He's uh, he's working out with with uh, uh, lumberjacks in northern uh, New York, and he, he grows out a beard, and mm -hmm. it's it's do everything you can to make an artificial sort of toughness. It becomes this interesting hyper extreme. If if you imagine that there was sort of a natural, uh, I guess a traditional masculinity imagined by people who are in manual labor uh, and farm work and that sort of thing. Now they're trying to sort of ape at a, a fake extra masculine masculinity, which I think is still around to some extent. If you watch advertisements for MMA shows, that that is that is a caricature of masculinity. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's that's really interesting. It's it's never really gone away, has it? The the um, I'm thinking of the men's movement. Which was on the one hand a kind of, a kind of, well, there's different strands of the men's movement in, say, the 1980s. One of it is a, a response to feminism, which is not opposed to feminism. And it's just a kind of, well, women are expressing themselves and finding their true identities. So should we, so should we men. There's another version, which is kind of um, the sort of fight club Tyler Durden version, which is the rejection of, of the feminized culture. But the, there's always been that that argument, which can be traced all the way back to Plato quite easily. And a lot of a lot of thinkers of physical culture do think about Plato and, and his academy and and the gymnasium. The history of the gymnasium is about producing strong, uh, tough men who will be able to think rationally and logically and clearly by virtue of their physical uh, toughness. So. 
you know, it's it's also now I'm thinking of City Slickers, you know, the film, the, it's like, you know, the, these, you've, you've been softened by culture. So we need to toughen ourselves up, whether that be through fighting or living in the forest. There's a, there's a long, I mean, is it an unbroken history or is it, is it chopped up? Does it, does it come back in different ways or what do you think? I think it's, I think it's unbroken, but we have to look at it in, in terms of its transmutation over time. The Dude Ranch is a wonderful example. I didn't even have a chance to get into that in my writing, but the, the Dude Ranch has a long history dating back to precisely this period because it refers almost exclusively to a ranch where wealthy urbanites are going to, to toughen themselves up, essentially copying the pattern that Roosevelt established by buying land in Wyoming originally, which, you know, has its positive outcomes too. That's the reason why the U.S. has a national park system. Uh, but at the same time, it, it becomes the butt of jokes, as all of these things do. You know, uh, we think about city slickers as the as the uh, paradigm of of that whole genre, where these guys go out, they do the they do the manly thing. It's too hard. They look silly, but in the end, they learn the lesson. Mm. And I mean, there there was even a children's show in the 1990s in the U.S. called uh, uh, Hey Dude that takes place on a dude ranch and it's about a wealthy man who purchases a dude ranch and he's made to look silly but eventually he learns the lesson and does become a man mm. it's this interesting uh it's this interesting story where we're we essentially take the hero's journey right where you become a true man at the end and we shift it to a later period in life mm. i mean is this is is this kind of uniquely North American or, or United States because of the sort of the heavy reference to these founding myths of frontier plainsmen, people, people adventuring out and facing, you know, the, un, the unknown. And then as soon as that becomes civilized and domesticated, there's that anxiety that, that it's somehow not American enough if you're not kind of tough enough and facing nature, maybe more than other nations, because they don't have that, the same founding mythology, they'll have a different set of mythologies. I, I think there, there is an element of extremism that Americans tend toward as a, as a people, uh, that is perhaps a bit more than most other cultures. But I'm always hesitant to think of America as being particularly unique in the world. I've spent the past couple of years really diving into some of the literature on uh, Japanese frontiersmanship, the uh, the trips, to, I mean, the creation of a Manchurian puppet state, but then there were all of these uh, uh, pamphlets and children's books and boys' magazines. Uh, I mean, the current, so so in, in Japan, the uh, some of the most popular magazines are actually for young, uh, young, I'm trying to think of, of the proper English phrase shonen. So like young men of a roughly adolescent age uh, that are, you know, they're comic books, but their history lies in these, in these uh, uh, propagandistic stories to convince young men when they're old enough to then go to the, to the Asian mainland frontier and to conquer the rough lands of the frontier. I mean, that's how uh, Morihei Ueshiba, the, the inventor of Aikido, you know, he goes off and does his great adventure there. Uh, and, and there are plenty of these stories available. So I don't, I don't know that the frontier adventure uh, genre is necessarily all that uniquely American, but Americans do take to it with an extremity that is unusual, okay. uh, as tends to be. <laughs> but maybe it's, maybe it's just like the view from where I'm sitting, you know, very far away from the US and um maybe the last four or five years have kind of uh, amplified my stereotypical thinking. But um, I mean, let's, so what, all right, let's go to the hairdresser. Cause it's very easy for us to talk about um, Roosevelt, Jiu Jitsu, the uh, American, you know, military operations in, in um, East Asia and, and that kind of, that kind of transnational communication um, or, or traveling of martial arts. Tell us more about the hairdresser. <laughs> um, his name was John Keehan at birth. He was born on the north side of Chicago to a relatively well-to-do family. Uh, his father was a physician, and by some accounts, his mother worked at a bank, but that's not entirely clear. Um, he joined the Marine Corps at 18, although some accounts say 17, and that he lied about his age, uh, 18 being the age of majority for most purposes. Uh, 
that's where the story becomes very interesting because there is the story of his life as he tells it and then there's the true account of John Keehan and it's very fuzzy as to which facts are facts and which are uh, I believe the current phrase is alternative facts <laughs> somewhere in here he well so first this ties back into how did East Asian martial arts land in North America anyway uh, and that goes back to a man named Robert Trius who was in the U.S. Navy during World War II and he studied some kind of karate from some kind of person who in in the accounts that Trius wrote has a Korean name mm -hmm. but when you look at the form of Trius's version of karate it's pretty clearly Shotokan but I mean that that could be I mean that, that's what they were teaching to the, the Koreans I mean that, that Taekwondo is essentially um short can i mean it well as you know is. i think we're both we share an interest in the in the writing and rewriting in the revisionism of, of, of uh korean martial arts i think we're both, i think anyone who knows even a little bit about that is immediately drawn to them as just such a fascinating case study but yeah i mean back in those days i mean if it was if it was korean um if it was taekwondo or whatever they were going to call it it was going to be short can absolutely What's curious about Trius' style of karate is that he has, if I remember, it's one or two forms that are not found in Shotokan, but are found in Okinawan styles. Uh, and the, the names are all Japanese. So it's tough to pinpoint exactly which period of Shotokan's development he would have learned this or where in his duty stations, because no such person as he names in the book ever is found in a record anywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's a challenge in its own right. But anyway, so Trius, he studies this, and he opens up what, as far as I can tell, is the first mainland karate school in the US that is marketed to the general public, mm -hmm. you know, outside of the Japanese American communities, which had various martial arts schools that were not open to the public. Uh, so Trius matters here because somehow John Keehan, located in Chicago, hears about Trius, located in Arizona, on the other side of the country, and starts making trips there on a regular basis, which was somewhat unusual in the late 50s, early 60s mm -hmm. to be traveling that frequently for karate's sake. Mm -hmm. uh, he somehow ends up over a few years uh, earning a black belt from Trius and takes it upon himself to become the promoter of karate tournaments in the US. Uh, he, he begins by just hosting local tournaments in Chicago in the usual uh, uh, point karate sparring fashion. And over time, he builds quite a following. It turns out he has a knack for this. He's he's uh, cribbing from other karate promoters like Masoyama. At one point, he ends up renting a bowl and riding around in the back of a pickup truck in, in downtown Chicago, shouting over, shouting over a loud horn that he's going to kill the bowl at the tournament. <laughs> yeah. uh, he's, he's quite an extraordinary character. He realizes that karate as as he is in, as he is picturing it it's going to appeal to young men who are seeking this sort of masculinity and so he begins advertising in the one place he knows they'll see it in the backs of comic books right next to the uh, charles atlas mm. uh, 70 pound weakling or whatever yeah. and he builds this this sort of it's almost like a pro wrestling style persona over time eventually legally changing his name to Count Juan Rafael Dante, which is why everyone calls him Count Dante now. And his claims become more and more extreme. He starts selling a pamphlet called uh, Deadliest Fighting Secrets. He founds the Black Dragon Fighting Society. Uh, he builds up this really interesting mythos for himself, which is later copied by uh, Frank Dukes as his own backstory and then modified slightly, which eventually leads to Bloodsport, yeah. possibly the greatest film ever made. <laughs> <laughs> I know people who would agree with that. I do know people who would, uh, people very respectable and eminent um, martial arts studies scholars who would entirely endorse that, that judgment. Oh, um, so uh, the hairdresser part, I always forget yeah. to explain this. All right. <laughs> he hand held a number of occupations in his life. He, uh, he owned a used car dealership. He sold a brand of Count Dante cigarettes at one point. Uh, 
uh, he was uh, he was a pornographer himself. And at one point, he was a professional hairdresser in the employ of Playboy magazine. Mm. I always when I read when I think of, of the subtitle of your book, because I, I read it when it first came out and, I, and, and then, you know, things get hazy. I always think that you must it must refer to Jay Sebring, but but it um, you know Bruce the, the the guy who introduced Bruce Lee to the world, but of course it doesn't. Right. But the connection of, of hairdressers there is is very interesting too. Um, yeah, I, I I think I could have been a hairdresser. I would have loved to be a hairdresser. Actually, it's a good occupation. I mean, it's safe. You don't have to fight anybody. Recession proof, <laughs> yeah, it's sociable. Uh, yeah. Um, but when you when you mentioned, I know because. You're, so you're an anthropologist by training, right? I mean, that's that's and 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 you. But you're. This is very text based. So you've you're an anthropologist who's really lived the archival research of the texts. Is that is that unusual in in your field, or was that a standard kind of approach? It. I I became an anthropologist by accident. Um, my goal was to study with my teenage hero uh, Thomas Green, whose books I read in the public library when I was what about 15 to 17 uh and which convinced me that hey you know what would be really neat to study this stuff professionally so when i found out that he was still taking graduate students uh when i was the right age for for that i applied and had the chance to go study with him. it just so happened that he was in an anthropology program and so that's what i pursued so i'm an anthropologist with a capital a and then i'm a folklorist with yeah. a with a lowercase f and folklore is its own field with a lot of ties to anthropology. So I'm, I'm sort of like a, uh, I'm sort of like a physician who is also a pharmacist. Yeah. Uh, so I, a lot of our work as folklorists is going into archives, which was a lot of fun. I got to go to Washington DC and dig through the national archives to, to find a lot of neat stuff. I wish I'd had more time. Um, but, and, it's and only then academics oral... who say that isn't it it's, like, it's really great I could go to a different city and stay in a library every day and not see any of the sites it was good I felt I felt among my people uh you know like you found your tribe when you visit the library of congress they also just want to stare at a book all day yeah. uh, it was wonderful but so um in terms of, of uh, specialty, I, I have an interesting mix of skills in that way because I'm an archeologist and I do ethnography and I also do archive work, hmm. which came in handy later uh, back, at, back at the university because Dr. Green was able to uh, work together with, with the family of the late Robert W. Smith to have all of his collections sent down. And I was made the, the primary uh, organizer of all of that work along with the along with the university archivist and that was a lot of fun as well yeah that does sound very interesting that's some that's some big name there that's some big archive i guess it was um, sizable yeah so when we were when you were talking and you, you were talking about count dante and advertising in the back of uh, magazines and comic books next to Charles Atlas. And so Charles Atlas was famous for selling dynamic tension, essentially, wasn't it? Where he would, this, you, you would get strong by, by doing different kind of different things like that would just involve clenching and, and, and pulling and pushing yourself against yourself. And we kind of laugh about that because it's such a, a well-known advert the the you know the the we, the young skinny boy who gets sand kicked in his face by a big bully who then takes his girl and then he goes off and trains but actually when you were talking there I was thinking about my social media feeds and like Facebook especially since the pandemic and the lockdown seems to be seems to think that I would hand over money for someone to show me how to roll around on the ground like walk like a cat learn how to do a handstand like and all the new peloton stuff as well it's like not even selling an exercise bike anymore it seems to be selling someone shouting at you to stretch more it's like how different is this it's it's you're a folklorist i mean you look for these these oral continuities and the it's the same isn't it it's the same structure it is and all of that was invented uh right around this same early time period when the ymca switches from being a christian association to an athletic association that happens to be christian hmm. uh, you know people forget that prior to the uh well really prior to to one of the early presidents named gulick 
uh, that the YMCA was diametrically opposed to athletic endeavor. Uh, it was only when he took over and was a proponent of physical culture, which was a new term at the time, that they began promoting physical wellness, physical education, that sort of thing. At the same time, we have uh, John Harvey Kellogg in Michigan, who is trying to convince the general public to exercise, be vegetarians, eat cornflakes, uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. It's this whole physical culture movement, which has not only continued unabated, but but if anything, picked up steam over time. Yeah, yeah. I recently saw an advertisement for what is basically the Peloton, except it's a box uh, punching bag. Okay. which I find very exciting. So now you're paying for someone on your phone to yell at you to hit the punching bag. Yeah. Very interesting stuff. I mean, these, 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 these kind of uh, forces, these currents in culture. So, you know, you've got, you've got Kellogg there at the birth of, 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 of formal physical culture advertising vegetarianism. And now we've got veganism coming in, coming so much into the fore and we've got, um, you know, you're, you're looking at the history of the YMCA. And I mean, it's there's so many different thoughts going through my head at the moment, because as you know, as I hope you remember, I set your book, the first couple of chapters of it, for my undergraduate students, because we begin a module called Body Image, where where I want them to think about physical culture. And we, we, we the, the kind of context that you give that, the way that you frame it is so interesting and so accessible that I, I think it's there their best entry point into some of the issues and we tend to think about like mass exercise campaigns very easy to visualize the kind of uh, the nazi national socialist educational campaigns of the 1930s but actually that was happening everywhere wasn't it i mean it, what we think of as yoga nowadays is closer to kind of swedish gymnastic training and it wasn't just in Nazi Germany where you know women were, were being taught how to move one way and, and young boys and teenage boys were being taught how this was everywhere wasn't it it's it's yes quite literally everywhere um I'm thinking of, you know in Japan they still do this there's a practice called radio taiso you've probably seen um Every morning, if you turn on the radio to a particular public station, there's a guy left over from World War II calling out the moves, and you'll see people, usually elderly folks and, and young children, but they do this in public schools still. Mm -hmm. um, Taiso just means like exercises or gymnastics in the classical sense, mm -hmm. and, and they're doing this everywhere. You look at China, where they have the official uh, CCP's version of, of the 24 form of Tai Chi, happening every day in the parks and you know in the u.s okay so we don't do that kind of national socialist practice anymore but you're still going to see organized physical endeavors that are intentionally trying to create a sense of national and group unity among people we talk about flow state where is flow state more apparent than when you're having soldiers in training march in unison Mm -hmm. And there's no reason for a bunch of Air Force recruits to be out marching in unison. They do it for psycho psychosocial reasons. Mm -hmm. This is interesting to me because as we look at in the book a little bit, and I, I, again, this is something I need to dive more into. Um, I have noticed over time that if you look particularly at how judo clubs operate, they take on for some reason a more nationalistic sensibility than most other martial arts organizations, you know, as a group. So if we look at judo in Japan, the nationalism in judo clubs is more rampant in, in periods just before uh, warfare is about to take place than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. If you look at Russia, they take judo and turn it into sambo, although judo itself is a very Russian nationalistic behavior. Uh, I mean, look at Putin, he's a, he's a judo champion. Uh, what it is about that, I'm not entirely sure yet, but it's interesting to see how those connections are made. And why does it matter? Because, uh, and this, this has been written about to some extent in the folklore literature, uh, you think with your body, and I, I, I suppose people forget about this, and maybe it's a result of, the, of the, uh, the split between this attempt to live a strenuous life and then doing brain work for a living, but you think with your body as much as with your mind. Your body remembers things that your mind doesn't necessarily spend time learning. Mm -hmm. So if you're using your body to create a group identity, it's going to remember that no matter what your intellectual mind thinks. 
Yeah, that's interesting. I was I was reading a book last night, actually. Um, it was the last thing I was reading before I went to bed. And it's a book called, um, it's called something like, it's either called The Mystic Experience or The Mystic Conditional State. And it was recommended to me by Daniel Morris. And the author is Somebody Paper. And one of the sections was talking about um, different types of mystic experience, kind of, you know, like altered states and so on. And it was talking about precisely military training. There's no, like it was since the First World War that, that they really started to train all forms of military personnel in just marching. And you don't really know about that unless you've marched with a group of people that you kind of lose your individual identity and you kind of get into the group dynamic in such a profound way that maybe you would march over a hill into a machine gun kind of thing. Um, but yeah, that so that kind of the way in which if we use some terms of Michel Foucault, the way in which these, these kind of body technologies work on us to produce us in certain ways, and that governments have cottoned onto this through the late 19th and early 20th centuries, which I guess leads us to towards the end of your book. It's near the end, isn't it, where we talk about um, UNESCO and Tekion and uh, and Taekwondo. Tell us a little bit about tell us a little bit about the the whole um, South Korea situation and UNESCO. I, I'm I'm very intrigued by UNESCO um, because it. So on paper, UNESCO doesn't seem to do much of anything in terms of intangible cultural heritage. They do a lot of other wonderful work and. Uh, you know, they, they help a great deal with children's wellness around the world and everything, but the intangible cultural heritage database does not make logical economic sense in a capitalist world. All it does is recognize that X practice, uh, this type of food or this particular physical location is national or uh, international intangible cultural heritage and I guess the intention is that means we should probably not muck it up and throw garbage everywhere. And yet nations will spend millions, billions of, of dollars trying to get this designation and then promote it. And no one has been more active about this than the South Koreans. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Trying to have Techion, which is basically a, a foot game similar to hacky sack well it's like a cross between hacky sack and tag right mm. trying to have this first formulated in a modern incarnation because as far as anyone seems to be able to tell that it, you know there are some apocryphal stories of this one man kept it alive for x number of years or what have you but i suspect it's largely a reinvention based on documents and then yeah. have it established as intangible cultural heritage uh why why would we need this? It, it's, it has to be, I think it's a lot like soft power. Uh, you know, the, the Japanese have mastered the art of soft power, the animated TV and cartoons and music and everything. And, and the South Koreans have, have found ways to one up them in that regard. Uh, I mean, K-pop is, is endemic now. Uh, so I think Techion is taking that route and it, and it somehow by tying it loosely to the existence of Taekwondo in that imaginary uh, myth, it's sort of a national myth they've created, right? It's like the Kalevala uh, about the creation of Taekwondo. Now Techion is this ancient and magical practice. And, and then we also have the ancillary story that people didn't talk about quite as much about a group of people called the Huarong. Yeah. you know, who were these upper class warriors, and now we've invented a whole martial art based around them as well. Uh, so it, it keeps reminding me of that Clifford Geertz quote, uh, when he's talking about the Balinese cockfight, where he says, it's, uh, it's all about the story that we tell ourselves about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's really interesting. I mean, I went to a, a conference in South Korea, you know, fully funded, who knows where the money comes from, right? But, you know, and um, and it, it was interesting to watch the, the arguments between, the, well, to watch the cultural symptoms play out between the Japanese and the South Korean scholars. All of the arguments are about whose culture is older, whose martial arts are older, 
who taught who how to how to sword fight and do archery and stuff like this and then and i um i actually ended up um going to a um i met a guy who everyone in everyone in south korea is eighth dan taekwondo right i met one guy who wasn't an eighth dan taekwondo you know every, literally everyone is eighth dan taekwondo and um <laughs> and this guy was a techion master right and and i said can i come and try it i'd love to, i'd love to try that and he and i went to his club after the conference and i thought it was brilliant and first of all he made me sit and and read a few chapters of a book to prove that it was ancient and that one guy continued the the legacy but whether it was ancient or not i thought it was fantastic it was like kind of wing chun really brilliant um dexterity with his feet and his legs incredible flexibility really different to anything that i'd seen but the fact that it has to be ancient for them is such an interesting symptom of the east asian culture wars isn't it, it has to be i mean i love it I, I you know there's that there's that argument um that I'm, I'm i'm also fascinated by the relationship between mainland china and taiwan right that's it's quite the volatile situation at the moment but one of the arguments for that that you will hear uh, the layman throw out in China, you know, just the guy on the street, is that well, because they uh, Taiwan once was this was a part of the same country, therefore it must be in the future. Hmm. And I I think that's that's part of it is uh, who who came first and who who threw the first punch and that sort of thing. Uh, but it's interesting as well that that's a somewhat recent invention because if you go back far enough in the past something coming from somewhere far away and exotic is uh is not a problem but is in fact a legitimization tool mm -hmm. and it's the same thing that happens in north america with uh with the establishment of of east asian martial arts as as an okay endeavor for tough guys to be doing right that makes it okay for jean-claude van damme to do karate because it's from far away and exotic so i'm not sure where that shift happens where now it needs to have always been here but um, i think that's far away and exotic in itself isn't it that kind of like allochronism that kind of it's ancient that that's 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 distant enough isn't it i mean people can be so people in in europe are fascinated can be fascinated by historical european martial arts because it's still mm -hmm. foreign it's 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 as foreign, might even seem more foreign than than something that we're familiar with, like kung fu or or, or taekwondo or, or Japanese martial arts. I mean, it's a kind That's, of distance in itself, isn't it? Time. It's a very good point, and it and it goes back. If we look at this to the, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember what these people called themselves. The uh, this this period of time in the late 19th century when uh, countries are creating their own national epics. Uh, you know, the, and the and and this is essentially what uh, Wordsworth was doing at one point, trying to create these stories that tell the origin of our people all the way back to the start, and that this story will be our national identity. And so now every country is trying to create its origin tale, mm. uh, which is interesting. It's essentially the same as like a superhero origin story; those being our modern myths, yes. uh, and and. So now we also need our, our national martial art has to go back to this very origin. You know, this happens in the US too, and people don't talk about it as much because, well, I don't know why, but there are folks who are trying to claim indigenous martial arts that are clearly organized by the, this, this typical Budo sensibility where you're wearing a, a uniform and you have a colored belt and patches and that sort of thing. Uh, but they're claiming that it's like the ancient Lakota martial art, mm -hmm. even though it looks like karate. Yeah. And that sort of thing. So it's, it's interesting how it's very romantic, you know, in the literal sense of the word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is, I think, you know, I, I've spent so much time writing about this stuff that I kind of think, oh, maybe I'm exaggerating it. Maybe it's not that big a deal, but it's, it's really still is going on. The, 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 the power of, of a myth of history and the imp and the importance that so many people attach to it like the, the, that it has to be ancient and if you suggest that it isn't or there isn't a continuous tradition 
some people lose their minds. I mean, I get hassled left, right, and center by by people who say that I don't, I can't say this about Tai Chi, and I can't, and and it because because it, it's a kind of universal spiritual thing that you are communing with the ancients, and it's like, yeah, okay, maybe you are in your imaginary sense. And maybe we've always had, like Bruce Lee said, you know, two hands, two feet, two legs, two arms. So how many ways to fight can there be? And the answer is millions of ways, millions of variations. <laughs> but it's such a huge thing, isn't it? The, the fascination of history, the, the pull and the hold of history. Well, and that I'm, I'm not just the history, but also that this is the deadliest version of this. This is the most effective version. This this is combat effectiveness is the most important thing. When I was living in Texas, I was training at this Aikido club. Um, I've done Aikido as a hobby off and on over the years. And uh, someone was asking me about the differences between Aikido in the States and Aikido in Japan. And I was explaining that in Japan, they're very open and, and, and uh, forward about this isn't really a fighting style. This is a completely different thing. It's it's sort of a philosophy we do with our bodies. It's a somatic philosophy, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and she thought about it for a moment and said, I'm insulted. <laughs> <laughs> why would you say something so terrible about the martial art I'm practicing? And I'm thinking, <laughs> why is that bad? Uh, What's yeah. wrong with saying that a pickup truck is not a race car? I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that is... But I, I think, I mean, I, I, I've i always, well, for like 20 years, I've done Tai Chi. And at first, for me, I really wanted it to be. I really wanted it to be a, a directly applicable martial art where the t you would use the techniques in a fight and, and, and you would use the principles in a fight. And it takes you a very long time to come to terms with what you are actually doing and what you are actually getting out of this. Because for me, I, I guess there's something about my sense of masculinity that I don't want to be doing some kind of physical therapy. I don't want to be doing some kind of moving meditation. I want to be doing something that's got something to do with fighting. And it's, it's, I still sometimes struggle with reconciling uh, what I'm doing with what I originally wanted it to be. Um, but but like mm. you know, so that 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 Aikido, that that the the person you're talking to, was it she? She she yeah. wanted it to be self defense, right? She wanted it right. to be just simple, pragmatic self defense. She wanted it to be Krav Maga or something like that or MMA, right? But but you're just saying, well, well, it isn't. And then if but it, that raised the question, well, what is this thing? And you have to find a whole new set of terms and concepts, and you might resist them because you don't want them. You don't want that <laughs> you want to be you want to be seagal right and seagal in his films you ought to be nico out to kill above the law <laughs> you know all that sort of stuff that's what you I love the great sense of keto, right <laughs> that's right and that and that was the that was the product sold to millions of americans once upon a time um but you know we we often misinterpret the way that that cultural artifacts are created um the I'm, I'm, so my mind always ends up going back to food. It's a, it's, it's a lifelong fascination, but I, I was intrigued recently to see on sale at a, you know, we have a, a grocery chain here called Trader Joe's. That's a subsidiary of Aldi. Um, and I was recently fascinated to see that they were selling a can of, uh, there's a, there's a Japanese sort of a condiment called furikake, which is a collection of seaweed and sesame seeds and other things that is traditionally put over plain rice to convince children to eat it and they were selling it as as like a cooking ingredient mm. like coat your salmon and furikake and that sort of and it's it's interesting to see how i guess it's it's like that concept of bricolage right where you have this collection of stuff and now you're going to create your own culture using it mm. I, I i suppose at the base that's what martial arts are is we have this tool or this brick or whatever and we're and we're trying to create a product we need using this preformed element yeah i think i think that food is a fascinating kind of way of trying to think about what's going on with culture and globalization and the national identity and stuff um and i know that you 
you we were talking before we we pressed record that that you're really interested in in um in nutrition and to to the extent that you, so you have been a victim of of, of the recession and, and especially the closing down of the of the the employment in academia so you currently don't have a job in a university and you're moving into to nutrition at the time being at least is that right right yeah i'm in a i'm in a program uh I'll, I'll spare you all of the annoying administrative details, but essentially in, in the U.S., uh, we have a term called, called a registered dietitian, which is the medical uh, that is can accept insurance uh, professional who, who specializes in clinical and, and athletic nutrition. Uh, I believe the U.K. term is qualified nutritionist, so anybody in another country can probably connect the dots and figure out what, what their local version is. Um, so yes, that's, I'm, I'm sort of shifting gears slightly to go that direction because as we talked about before, my, one of my main concerns, uh, professionally is, is, uh, a body image and image disorder and that sort of thing. And particularly in men who are radically underserved in that space. In fact, recently the, the BBC ran a special called, uh, well, I can't remember the title, but it starred Freddie Flintoff. The, oh, uh, yeah, the yeah, cricketer. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that it was a, a documentary about his um his bulimia. Right. Um, the, the cricket the cricketer who who had bulimia and he came out very publicly. And that is the first public television special about a man with an eating disorder. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's 2021. Yeah. And we still can't talk about it. That's really it's really interesting. I mean, I think that in terms of people who are into martial arts and combat sports, I mean, it, it ties into some of some of the issues around things like cutting weight before a fight and some of the pressures and what that might lead to. Well, and do you know what the single most abused uh, illegal substance in the UK is? Probably steroids, right? Right. Anabolic steroids. Yeah. We don't even have accurate numbers because it is so common. You can just buy them over the internet and everyone at the gym is doing it yes yes and then they're all going out in britain everyone goes out and gets drunk as well so you're god knows what you're doing to your liver and kidneys and your yeah they all yeah get diabetes and all sorts of different things we should um i'm conscious of how long we've been talking and i i, I try not to let the podcast episodes go on you know too long because i think we you know much as i'm fascinated by everything it tries people's patience but i think jared we, we're gonna have to have a part two i think we'll have to follow up with with more thinking about food and nutrition and and, and connecting that to your your folklore interests and your anthropological interests um, oh happily i can go on about curry for hours oh my God. <laughs> I could, no i can't talk about it for too long i then i run off to the <laughs> order a curry immediately it's so good well, Why is it all about, so good? We can talk about we can talk about the Gracie diet, and we can talk about martial arts and nutrition, and oh, and, the history of food combined. Yeah. Oh, and and food in the Ayurvedic diet and and yoga. Let's, let's do that. Let's do that next. But um, what I'll do is I'll 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 say thank you now, and uh, we'll definitely have to book a time in a in a few weeks or a couple of months, and we'll we'll do something on food. That would be great. Yeah. Fa all right. Well, Jared Miracle. Um, thank you ever so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you. It's great seeing you, Paul.